being able to relate to an anime villain due to their tragic backstory or circumstances or even eventual goals. That's perfectly understandable. I mean, I kind of feel bad for certain villains. I kind of see where certain villains are trying to go. But at the same time, seeing yourself in anime villains is the reason why I love so many of them. This comes to mind because in the latest episode of Mob Psycho 100, which pushed Mob Psycho into my top 10 anime of all time, we were introduced to the president of Claw. Now, the president immediately recognized Mob as a threat when Mob used an ability to share his power with another because that's the very same power the president has himself and holds so much pride in. After seeing that and seeing their obviously similar powers, it kinda hit me that the main character Mob that we know and love is essentially the same exact character as this president who seems to be the epitome of evil right now. The guy is standing on top of his tower, declaring war on the world, firing down lasers at those that dare oppose him. This guy really doesn't seem all too relatable. He decided to do all this because, well, he could. He had the power to do all this. Now, Mob is a very nice dude. He's someone who always went about trying to make friends, tried to look at things as they are and speak his mind freely. He'll never use his powers for personal gain just because he doesn't feel like that'll get him ahead in life. He feels like it'll be far more worthwhile for him to go to the body improvement club, to work out, to chill with friends, to make friends, to get the girl that he likes to like him back. He knows that he can't do that through psychic powers. He realizes that psychic powers, despite making his life easier, would not make the end goal he's looking for any more approachable. The president, however, sees things in a very different light. He was born gifted and he was born with these talents. Might as well put them to good use. They can make everything go far smoother and work far easier. Easier. No, this isn't really spoilers for what Mob Psycho is at all. It's just kind of pointing out that this main villain that happens to share the same style psychic powers as Mob, our main character, they're exactly the same. The only difference is Mob's perspective on life is seeing a value in others, while the president's perspective on life is primarily seeing value in himself. Aside from this one very slight perspectival glance at what the world has to offer, they created two entirely opposite people that are currently in middle of one of my favorite anime fights ever. But the really scary thing is, being that I personally do not have psychic powers on the level that I could transfer my energy and steal energy from others, that's just not what I'm gifted with. Slight telekinesis? Yeah, sure. But that level, no. So I don't exactly relate to Mob as the main character on the uh, psychic power perspective. I relate to him more on the personal perspective that his main goal is not world domination, but it's to lead a content normal life, to have friends that he cares about and that, in return, care about him. Yes, granted, mob psychic powers make it hard for him to lead a normal life, but then again, every single individual, be it me, you, or anyone else that has not seen this video that you should totally show this video to, we have our own quirkiness. We're all different here. Stay weird fam is my actual motto, and it's good, and you should embrace it, and make it part of yourself. But at the same time, you gotta conform to society. You gotta have your friends that you care about, and your friends that care about you back. Mob's crazy psychic powers are next level, making him weird. But like, any issue that prevents you from forming relationships, it's something that has to be overcome. For all these reasons, I crazy relate to Mob. Add that to his naivete, and I see a character I very much feel for, and very much can place myself in his shoes. So, due to the fact that I'm experiencing Mob Psycho 100 in this fashion, especially in how I regard Mob, when Mob sees himself in this president, this utterly evil individual, abusing the gift he was given because of his perspectival difference in the world, his slight slight different take on everything than Mob that led him completely astray, I see myself in him too. I relate to this crazy evil anime villain guy. I realize that even looking at things slightly differently, even making some slightly different choices, I or anyone can head down this crazy path of darkness and evil. And I know it sounds stupid, but in all honesty, this made me think about a lot of other anime villains that I fell in love with. And I feel like so many of them share this property of the protagonist that I relate to seeing themselves in this villain. For example, Pain is my favorite villain in Naruto. And he is a literal opposite of Naruto due to circumstances that pushed him astray. They both had really tough pasts that toughened them up on a character level. They both had Jiraiya as their sensei that they both looked up to to an insane degree. But in the end of the day, after Naruto became a ninja, he actually finally made friends and really appreciated them. Whereas when Nagato became a 
ninja, he lost friends. Yahiko died in front of him. Between this utter cycle of pain that he felt, where that speech hits so hard, that there will always be more pain. When you inflict pain upon someone else, they'll want to inflict pain back, and the cycle continues. It cannot be broken. So, Nagato's trying to look at the world as an ends justifies the means scenario in the most realistic light possible. He's experienced death of close comrades. He had to make up his mind on certain decisions, even if it meant killing his master. And he had Toby whispering in his ear, providing very bad advice. Naruto had all those things as complete opposites. The advice that was whispered into his ear was only positive. He lived through the third Hokage dying for his village, Jiraiya dying for his village, Kakashi, who at this point died for his village. The values he's been getting from his surroundings are only positive, whereas Nagato and his relationship with Toby was only destructive. At the same time, Naruto realized that talk no jutsu works. It's worked for him in the past, and it helped him see the world through an idealistic lens. Granted, there's tragedy that could befall anyone, but if you're an ultimate good, you'll be able to snuff out ultimate evil. Naruto didn't accept Pain's take on the cycle of hatred, despite the fact that it hit him all too hard. People give Naruto a lot of crap for talk no jutsuing Nagato at the end. After defeating all the Pain bodies and approaching Nagato, where Conan had the ability to kill the very weakened Naruto, Nagato stopped her because his talk no jutsu took effect. Now, I think that it was brilliantly done in all. In the end of the day, this entire dispute between Naruto and Pain philosophically was Naruto's idealism versus Pain's end goal realism. He was willing to become the villain of the world, take control of the tail beast crazy weapon thingy that everyone would fear, and if everyone feared him as a superpower, there would only be peace. Naruto also seeked peace, but through a different way. And what proved this to Pain was, even though Pain killed Naruto's master, two of Naruto's masters, in fact, wiped out Konoha, injured so many of his friends, had this long, grueling fight, and then when Naruto met him, Naruto did not kill him. Naruto did not continue the cycle of pain. Despite the pain inflicted to him, he was willing to not reciprocate. This is the ultimate philosophical victory. That's why the Naruto versus Pain fight's one of my favorite fights ever, because with Naruto resisting the temptation to kill Nagato, he proved that no, the world can thrive on idealism. The cycle can be broken, and I'll break it here and now. Both Naruto and Nagato were students of Jiraiya. They both held very similar principles that at a certain point took a terrible turn. And someone who's been following Naruto's journey for like 500 episodes until this point really got to understand who Naruto is and be able to see the world through his eyes. No, he's not my favorite protagonist in anime, but that's really not the point. We got to see his good heart and his take on life. We got to see how his friends mattered to him and influenced him in his various decisions and ideals. And likewise with Pain, who had the very same sensei, but thrown into a much, much tougher situation. He grew up through war. He had to survive with his few friends like rats. They managed to band together and seemingly make a peace treaty, and then Hanzo killed Yahiko, his closest friend, and the leader of this Akatsuki. He entered a cycle that could not be broken, and he wasn't willing to break it. He, Pain himself, is subject to his own philosophy. Whereas Naruto, who's never killed a single character in the entirety of the series, even Kakuzu, after whacking him with a Rasen Shuriken, Kakashi finished him off, is untainted, remains idealistic, and can break a cycle of pain. With a slightly different past, and slightly different friends influencing you in different ways, Naruto would have become a pain. He would have been able to share his ideals, but it's due to circumstances substantial scenarios, that and the power of friendship that he was able to overcome all of this. Not that he wasn't able to see himself in pain, but that pain saw himself in Naruto, and that is why he gave up. That's why he sacrificed his life to revive the people he's killed in the Lee Village, fully entrusting himself to Naruto's idealism. Surrounding influence is all too important, and so is circumstances of life. What would happen to you if you would have had an Obito whispering in your ear? I don't know what every individual one of your pasts are, but in the end of the day, they shaped who you are. They could have produced anything along the entire spectrum of humanity. You can get the pinnacle of lofty, idealistic, good guy Naruto, and you can get let's take over the world. I'm freaking evil pain. Let's be honest, I'm more like pain. Others, more like Naruto. <laughs> Maybe that's just because every YouTuber is a sociopath. It's a fact. Every YouTuber is a sociopath. Maybe that's why I like Pain as a character a lot more than Naruto. But it's not the point. In the end of the day, I don't have a Rinnegan, so I'm not taking over the world, unfortunately. Maybe in another lifetime, but with slightly different circumstances. Never know. I might be actually trying to do that instead of talking about doing that. And as we know, no evil mastermind talks about taking over the world before actually having a plan of how to take over the world. Now, I'm not calling myself an evil mastermind or that I'm planning on taking over the world. 
world. But if it happens, this is epic foreshadowing. And speaking of the power of idealism, one of the biggest reasons why I love Pokemon to its entirety is the idealism of it. Dude, this is your own fictional universe. You get the endlessness from the anime, the epicness of the manga, and your personal adventure playing the games. It is pure idealism. That's the setup. It's a 10 year old kid sent away from home to gather these monsters that can rip him limb from limb. But he'll be okay. Yeah, he can take on the mafia. Yeah, he can adventure the land. Yeah, he can become the Pokemon champion after only training for like a year, beating all these guys that were training their whole lives. It doesn't matter. You can do it. You work on it, you'll get there. Pokemon is staged in a world of idealism. And in the manga, Red is that idealistic character that's also a total badass. I mean, the guy works hard, the guy trains a lot, but he's upbeat about everything. He's morally righteous and he's powerful enough to kick everyone's asses in the end of the day. But he does it out of love. He trains his Pokemon because he loves his Pokemon. He's adventuring altogether because he loves the adventure of it. He sees life through an idealistic lens. And the main villain, at least in the beginning of the Pokemon Adventures manga, Giovanni, is in my top three villains in anime. Because what Giovanni is, what the mafia is altogether in Pokemon, is materialism and realism. Team Rocket's all about the scientific advancements. They're gonna make a hell of a lot of money. They captured an Eevee and did genetic testing on it so it can switch freely from Flareon to Jolteon to Vaporeon back and forth. They created Mewtwo out of the DNA of Mew and humans since they didn't have enough Mew DNA. When Lieutenant Surge fights Red, they're in an electric arena where he's wearing electric proof clothing, trying to shock Red to death. The guy has a bazooka that he's firing exploding electrodes at him one after the other. He needs to get the job done. By the way, Lieutenant Surge worked for Team Rocket. He's not a regular ass gym leader. Fun fact. And Giovanni's the leader of all of it. Giovanni is the careful planner and the ultimate enemy to the Pokemon world because he is pure material realism. Red and Giovanni are two sides of the same coin. They both started off their journey as a Pokemon trainer trying to be the very best, the best there ever was. The only difference is Giovanni thought that dropping an idealistic tone in this idealistic world and taking on a sense of realism and materialism is what it means to grow up. He traded love for power and that's what led him down his path and led him astray. After fighting Red, however, he kind of goes all double agent, kind of turns good. He becomes a bit of an anti-hero, in fact. He takes out a lot of important Team Rocket guys, and he doesn't mind getting his hands dirty. At one point, he fights Price, the ice gym leader of Johto, and with an Ursa Ring, he slashes him across his chest, trying to kill him because he was a bad dude. Giovanni is the idealistic trainer gone astray, which makes him the perfect adversary for Red in the Pokemon manga. And don't tell me you can't see yourself in him. He has fame, he has power, he has everything he could want. He's a mafia boss. And in the end of the day, none of that makes him happy. Dropping his idealistic look at life and his love of what he's doing hardened him into a man that is greedy for more, more, and more. He captured all the legendary birds. He nearly took over the Kanto region. But none of that will bring happiness in the end of the day. In the end of the day, happiness needs to come from love. Cringy as that sounds, after he sees Red and learns from his fight with Red, Red doesn't talk no jutsu him because Red doesn't talk a lot. But in the end of the day, Giovanni is that badass idealist trainer that became the tip top of what a Pokemon trainer could be, but then made the decision that power is worth more than love. He's the guy that makes videos for subscribers, but doesn't actually make videos talking about what he likes talking about. Maybe that's just relating the situation to my personal life, making these freaking long ass videos on not specifically popping relevant topics. But that's the life choices, fam. I know I'm happier making videos I enjoy making than trying to catch the latest trend and the latest hype. And it doesn't only apply to YouTube, it applies to freaking everything. If you're going to college, do something you love doing. In the end of the day, don't get a degree in underwater basket weaving because it's not exactly a market that's making billions right now. But following your dreams is freaking underrated. And Giovanni learned that the hard way. I see myself in Giovanni because doing YouTube is idealism, damn it. No one goes into making YouTube videos expecting to make money off it. It's a pipe dream. The fact that you guys like and subscribe means the world to me. Giovanni is the guy that would have gone to college and then got in a mafia organization take over the world. Why do I relate to villains trying to take over the world, damn it? Anyway, please subscribe because when we hit a million subscribers, next step is world domination. And speaking of relating to villains trying to take over the world, have y'all seen Hunter x Hunter? Potentially one of the greatest anime of all time. You ever heard of Meruem? A pretty main villain there? King of the Chimera Ants and almost king of the known world. This guy was born to be king. In fact, he was pretty much mostly called king.
king. The guy had ultimate power and nothing that could stand in his way. The way his character was crafted before he was even born into this world. We had an entire part one of the Chimera Ant arc showing the dominance of this species and how the queen was forever savagely scrounging down food to create this super leader, to create the king as an unstoppable force, to create the ultimate monster. And as the arc progressed, Meruem became the ultimate human. In contrast to Gon, who through the arc descended and went from an idealistic human to a savage monster, Meruem had a complete flip of that, constantly in conflict between his chimera ant and human side, until eventually his human side is the one that won out. The Hunter Hunter Chimera Ant arc is the ultimate exploration into the human psyche. It sees what makes humans tick and the narrator very clearly expresses it. In every single fight from every angle, we're seeing a different take on how to think. Whether it's Pito, Poof, Yuppie, Knuckle, Killua, Gon, or Meruem, we get entirely different perspectival glances from every single one of them, but mostly from Meruem. And in the end of the day, the Chimera Ant arc is freaking tragic because it has a positive ending. With the perception in her mind from before the king was born, until the king was born and was a supreme ruler, living to fulfill the purpose he was born for. The king was the furthest thing from human. The king was the epitome of monster. But as time went on, and as he found his special someone that he enjoyed spending time with, realizing the power of individuality, how Komugi, a little blind girl, would never defeat him in a fist fight. No, in a one-on-one -on -one battle, she would perhaps even lose to a Magikarp. Even Leorio had a shot against her. But in Gungi, this strategy game that they were playing, she was undefeated. She would defeat Meruem every single time, and he began to realize the specialness of an individual. It's clear that this is the lesson he learns when he fights Netero, and Netero taunts him into attacking because Meruem does not want to fight Netero. Meruem says, you are a special someone, and you are not worth killing. I am gonna try to avoid the major spoilers in the arc, but his death freaking makes you cry, fam. This monster that was implanted in our mind to hate before his conception, that was an ultimate force of evil when he was born, that committed so many atrocities that it's hard to keep track. This is the most human character in Hunter x Hunter by the end of the Chimera Ant arc. When Zeno and Netero come and invade the palace to attack him, and they land where Komugi is injured, Meruem, with the most utmost of care, gently puts Komugi down, unconscious as she is, and says to Pito, Pito, please cure her, and then says to Zeno and Netero that they will fight elsewhere. He knows the fight needs to take place, but he is showing such care for a seemingly insignificant other that it's terrifying for Netero and for Zeno. He walks past them in an extremely powerful scene where both Netero and Zeno feel the extreme difference in their power. They realize that then and there he could have potentially killed them, but presumably being that they allowed him to tend to Komugi when she was hurt, he will allow them to continue living at this very moment. In this arc, Gon, a character who was always an idealistic kid, due to suffering he became a monster, and Meruem, a monster just set on completing his purpose of taking over the world and ridding it of humanity, through love became a human. At the very end he welcomed his death, spending it with the person he cared for most. I don't know who you could relate to if you can't relate to Meruem, and if you don't relate to Meruem it's almost sad, and in the end of the day it's almost sad if you're not relating to a freaking monster that was born to wipe out humanity, it has ultimate power, it's nigh invincible, and in the end of the day you're gonna cry like a bitch when he dies. Only anime, god damn it. In Shinsek Ayori, or from the new world, an anime that not a lot of people have seen. Humans have ultimate power. They're these crazy telekinetic thingos, and they're basically revered as gods by were-rats. And in return, they kind of treat the were-rats as slave type of people. Bad vibes. I guess it's a semi-symbiotic relationship. They do help each other out, but in the end of the day, these were-rats are not living on the same standards as humans exactly. Squealer ends up leading a rebellion. He ends up causing the were-rats to try to kill out the humans, despite having far less power. And we don't need to get into the various strategies, but in the end of the day, he loses. Villain loses usually happens in anime. And when Squealer's in human court, where they're going to decide his punishment, he gives a pretty scary speech. When they keep calling him a monster or a were-rat, he says, I am a human. And they all laugh at him. It's later revealed that the way were-rats were created, and the reason why they exist, is because inbred into the human's genetics are that they cannot use these superpowers against one another. And if they do, they die. This is done so that people don't kill each other out and there aren't these massive wars of these crazy psychic wizard guys. Now, the were-rats are not humans and therefore they can be controlled. 
But what's only revealed later is that the Werehats were actually humans at one point. They were humans that were genetically altered to be more werehat like so that their powers can affect them and therefore they can control them. Once this information is leaked, the entire series is rewatched where Squealer is the freaking underdog protagonist and he loses in Arslan Sankey, which is a series written by the creator of Fullmetal Alchemist actually, where the main character Arslan is the prince of his country. One day when they end up in war, his country falls. This isn't exactly major spoilers, it is the first episode after all, and the main antagonist seems to be the silver mask guy. A guy with a very burnt up face so he wears this really badass looking mask and silver mask is a sick character. And then you realize that silver mask, this isn't a massive plot twist, we all kind of saw it coming, was the rightful heir for the throne and it seems like by him taking over this country he's kind of getting what he deserves. Arslan's papa didn't exactly treat him with honor and dignity, it seemed almost like he tried to kill him so he can get the throne for himself. Silver mask is basically Arslan with a sadder backstory and uh, uh, not a pussy in Gurren Lagann. You have a story about using your humanity to drive you forward, where spiral energy is essentially willpower and the ability to break the mold. It's to surpass your limits. The anti-spirals are seemingly an enemy, and they think it's too dangerous for these limits to be surpassed. But also, the anti-spirals are literally the mindset that Kamina discards in episode one of Gurren Lagann. Episode one Kamina is the ultimate contrast to what the anti-spirals believe in altogether. Without this Kamina just by wanting to see the surface without even knowing there was one. It gave humanity the wherewithal to not become another suppressed race, but actually a race that can evolve. The main villain in Psychopath Makishima is literally exactly what Akane the main character is. They have the same quirk that the civil system doesn't seem to affect them. Now, the only difference is Akane thinks that you gotta play by the rules to fix what's broken from the inside, and Makishima thinks that you gotta wreck it by force because of all the injustices it's doing. But Makishima, once going down that path, became a freaking horrible human being and a tremendously terrifying villain. A villain that Akane was one step away from becoming. The Beast Titan from Attack on Titan, I won't spoil anything. In the recent manga chapters, you really begin to understand where the thing is coming from. Anyone under circumstances like that, taking one or two steps the wrong way, and your entire life is different. Sensui from Yu Yu Hakusho is literally justified under certain pretenses. I relate to all these ridiculously evil anime villains and more than just relating to them, more than understanding their motives, their backstories, feeling bad for them, I see myself in some of the most evil of anime villains. Whether it's Pain, who got affected by the circumstances he grew up in and the people that convinced him as far as what to do. Whether it's the president in Mob Psycho that held so much value to himself it belittled the importance of others and led him to a life of self-destruction. Whether it's Giovanni, who threw away idealism and love for materialism and power. Whether it's Squealer, who despite all the horrible acts he's done, they were all done due to the injustices placed upon him. Whether it's Silver Mask, someone rightfully an heir to the throne, but because of the unfairnesses dealt to him by others, he ended up causing thousands and thousands of lives to end and nearly caused the destruction of the very country he was supposed to govern under normal circumstances. Or whether it's Meruem, who's a complete flip side of all of these. Payne, Giovanni, the president, Mob Psycho, these are all characters that I see myself in, but they took one step further and it completely changed everything about them. You gotta be completely careful because you don't want to exactly walk down a path of self-destruction, becoming an epic anime villain. No one wants to become an epic anime villain, okay? When I see myself in Pain, Giovanni, and the President, it freaking terrifies me. It terrifies me how close everyone is to completely falling before circumstances that surround them or slight life decisions they make. But Meru a complete flip side because I don't relate to the monster side of Meruem at all. Meruem isn't born okay but then goes astray. It's quite the opposite in fact. He's born as a monster. He's playing his role as the monster. He's destroying humanity as a monster but despite that even though he's this crazy black-hearted all-powerful nigh immortal and invincible monster even he can change. Even he can become human. He sees himself in me. So can't we all do better too? It's not just a few steps that we can take that can lead us the wrong way but imagine taking a few right steps can do. That's why Meruem is one of the greatest villains of all time. That's why Giovanni is one of the greatest of all time going full circle as a character. That's why Pain's my favorite villain in Naruto and that's why you should watch Mob Psycho 100. That's why I generally love anime villains on a level way deeper than I like any other villains in any other media. Lord of the Rings are my favorite movies. I don't relate to Sauron. Does anyone here relate to Emperor Palpatine or Lord Voldemort? 
I don't think so. Anime does something special. I don't. But I do see myself in the most black-hearted of anime villains. I see a path that is all too open to me, just like it's all too open to the protagonists that are the polar opposite and foils of these villains. I love anime. Anime is a place where I can find myself weeping over the death of a nigh-invincible ant monster that's more human than I am.